with Tommy Robinson. Tommy Robinson quoted from the Quran, and at the point where he waved the book around, Piers Morgan told him to show some respect and put the book down. And that, that is the contention of this discussion today. Surely in the free world, we as non-Muslims are entitled to treat the book as we please. We're entitled not to entirely sort of, you know, throw it on the floor or whatever, but to actually contest every single word. Is this not what we learnt from Charlie Hebdo, from those cartoonists who were murdered in cold blood because they um, insulted um, Islam? 03444991000. So who is the idiot? Am I an idiot for talking about this? Is Tommy Robinson an idiot or is Piers Morgan the idiot? You decide by texting us at 8722. And let's have a chat now with Tommy Robinson, who is also the author of uh, his new book, Enemy of the State. Tommy, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Tommy, I was, I think, as outraged as you were. I think uh, you are entitled to your point of view. And you were in, I think, in my opinion, uh, 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 an aerated point, uh, sort of view of, uh, of London, which doesn't seem to understand where you come from in Luton, which, though 30 miles from that uh, television studio, could be 3,000 miles away. Yeah, and it's what I found was how scared Piers got, how scared he got because I picked up the Quran, how scared everyone in the studio got because I picked up the Quran. Now, that is what I say is Islamophobia. That is, they are fearful. And they're fearful of a reaction. And, they, and I, can, I can bet my money that he had coming through his earpiece, get him to put it down, get him to put it down, pull him, pull him, pull him. Just because I'm picking up a book and asking questions. And I wasn't disrespecting it. I was just picking it up. And I was quoting with Sir William Gladstone. We have statues of, of him in our capital city. I was quoting Winston Churchill, previous world leaders who have rec recognised Islam and recognised what it was about. And Sir William Gladstone held the Quran above his head in Parliament and he said, there will never be peace on this earth so long as we have this book. This book is a violent and cursed book. And that's not, that wasn't Tommy Robinson saying that. That was me quoting William Gladstone. And, and, and that's, when it, that's when the panic came in from them. He said, show, it some, show the book some respect. And, um, Tommy, yeah. a couple of weeks ago, I had the Ahmadian Muslims in here who are a peaceful sect of Muslims. And one of the reasons I had them in was that I was not getting any satisfactory answers from inside the Muslim community to talk about their appalling reaction to the murderers. And they started by saying that Islam is an idea and that the people who perpetrated that murder in London Bridge and Borough Market were not Muslims by definition. I insisted that they were, they had Muslim names. We developed a conversation. Would you not accept, Tommy, that actually the Quran isn't always necessarily regarded as an evil book because it is being interpreted by different sects of Islam? In other words, the Ahmadians do not interpret it in that warmongering way and that actually there is a civil war going on inside Islam. Um, the Ahmadians are not recognised. They, they are peaceful. They are the, a, a peaceful sect, but they're not recognised by the rest of the, the Muslim world. They're seen as apostates. They're pu it's punishable by death. They're targeted in Pakistan. They're not allowed to go to Mecca. So in, in, in the world view, they don't see Muhammad as, last, as the last prophet. Um, so I would, when it comes down to interpretation, there's only certain ways to interpret certain, certain structures, especially when you look at the life of Muhammad. I, I always bring it back to Muhammad. As well as the Quran, it's Muhammad. Well, when you go through the life of Muhammad, what Muhammad did, you can only interpret he beheaded 600 people. He married a six-year-old girl, had sex with her when she was nine. He raped, he pillaged, he tortured a man called Kanana. He tortured him and burned his chest for his gold and robbed him. Now, there's only certain ways you can interpret that. That's factual, that's what happened. That's not, again, that's not me saying that. That's Islamic scripture. That's Islamic scripture. I'm, I'm just pointing it out. So to say Islam is a religion of peace is just, it's a facade, it's not. It never has been. Mohammed was not a peaceful man. He was a warmonger. He was a very violent man and a very immoral man. And that's just and that's just uh, that's yeah. That's just me putting 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 the facts out about Islam. That's what some people get so offended by. It. Just as and the Ahmadians are entitled to their worldview, uh, you are entitled to your worldview on this particular radio show. And that's the one thing that I always say. You know, we should have free speech. What I want to say to you, Tommy, is. Yeah. You're from Luton. I'm originally from Birmingham. We have a similar demographic in our cities that we come from. We will have to live forever in perpetuity in this sceptered isle. 
How are we going to do that if we're this far apart? Well, that's, I know, and the problem's getting worse. That's what I get so worried about. The demographical change, the growth forecast, for the, for the say, say, for example, I'll talk about Luton again. The Pakistani and the Bangladeshi communities will increase by 70 to 77 percent by 2030. That's government projected growth forecast. Our communities will increase by 1.3 or 1.4% in that same period. Now, that wouldn't be a problem if we didn't see the huge problems that are in those communities. Massive problems. And that doesn't leave me as a father of three living in the town with any hope. Right. So the question is, Tommy, OK, so for you as a white minority in Luton, does that mean that you're going to live in a rural area of the country or in a smaller town? What does this mean to white British people who feel like you and, and, and perhaps also while we're on the subject to other smaller minorities, for example, Sikhs and Jews. Are we going to see that all cities are effectively Islam and then all villages might just be, uh, if you like, all white British and other ethnic minorities? Well, that is how it's going. If you, if you go around the outskirts of Luton now, you've got little, little English enclaves to form. The villages have all had to double and treble and quadruple in sizes all the way around the outskirts of Luton. And when you go to those villages, for example, you go there on Boxing Day, you go, you, they, they will celebrate, they'll have Morris dances, they will really celebrate their culture and their identity, which they haven't been able to in Luton. And it's, it, it's literally, it's Little Luton. That's where everyone, everyone calls the places, it's Little Luton. It's where all the people from Luton have gone to. And, and out of my generation, out of my generation, out of all of my friends, there's none left in Luton. There's none left. None. And that doesn't come from... And when you go through, when you're actually having children, there, there, is a, there is a hostility towards us. A hostility towards... I, I had it when we were growing up at school. So the next generation, it gets worse and worse and worse. So the people are running. And, it, and it's not... And when they call it white flight, it's not white flight. It's white and black size. Mm. Everyone's running. Everyone's running. And, and then but, it, okay. the major cities to be dominated by Islam. OK, so we have demographic flight. We have a movement of people. And we have an immigration issue which won't go away. Our successive governments both uh, here and in Europe, um, insist that we should have a weight of refugees, which is changing the character of our cities and towns. Tommy, apart from you taking your own personal action for your family, what should government do? What should the media do? Where is the narrative going on? Why is there such a disconnect between people in the street and, <laughs> should we say, the establishments of politics and media? And it's because they don't live with it. They don't live with it and they don't understand it. And, it does, and it's not their problem. Because they it's like, for example, again, I'll bring it back to Luton. I went to a meeting years ago when I was called in by Luton Bar Council at the start of the English Defence League. And they called us in for a meeting. They had a baroness. They had about eight people sat in this meeting. They videoed it. And they said, tell us what your problem is. Tell us what's wrong. So I just went through. There was eight people, one Muslim in the room. And I said, where are you from? Where do you live? To the first person, she didn't live in Luton, she lived in the village. Where do you live? Lived in Hitchin. Where do you live? Where do you live? Where do you live? What's your background? What's your background? What's your education? University, middle class. And I got to the Muslim, I said, you, You're from Berry Park, aren't you? You're from Luton. He said, Yeah. I said, He's the only one who represents his, his community. I said, You seven do not represent us and don't understand us. And you're here making decisions for us. That's the problem. That, that for me, that's the problem. So you don't even understand, you haven't been brought up in Luton. You don't know how, you don't know how what makes the town work and the problems it has, and yet you're here you're here making the decisions. And all we sh what we should have been doing for years is I think America does so much better is encouraging every single minority in this country to be part of it, to feel British, to feel English, to celebrate that. But we don't. We've allowed every community to to section itself away. We've actually encouraged, encouraged that. And sometimes it hasn't even been their fault. It's actually been our government's fault. I have and American family, Tommy. Right and. We were all dispersed around the world after the Second World War. I think you know what I mean. Uh, our families went to the United States uh, just to pursue their lives so they could live their lives. Some came to Britain. In America, there is this idea of Ellis Island. Bring us your poor and your destitute. The Statue of Liberty is that inspiration. Here in Britain, we have Victoria Coach Station. There isn't a narrative, is there? There isn't a British narrative. But Tommy... Could there ever be one? What are British values? That's the question. And, you know, if we don't have recognised British values, which are backed up with a sort of religion, if you like, if you, uh, for example, Christianity, are we not actually, in the end, going to be defeated? 
Yeah, you know, I'd say, and again, I'll just bring it back to Luton again. <clears throat> I'll bring it back to the young English kids in Luton. They're walking around with their heads down. They're walking around with their heads down because they don't know who they are. They don't know their identity. Every other culture in, that, in our town, we have St. Lucian Day. is huge to celebrate. St. Patrick's Day is a three-day festival. Easy to celebrate. Everyone's identity is celebrated, apart from the English identity. You know, it's not celebrated. But all the schools sent out, this is going back years again, all the schools sent out letters to the children. And if you bring in the, the emblem of St. George, on St. George's Day, you'll be sent home from school. Now, the message that sends out is that we should be, uh, we should be ashamed of who we are, ashamed of our culture. And until we have pride back in working-class communities and pride in, pride in who they are, pride in their history, pride in their culture, then you're never going to be it. Because that's why so many people now are converted. Because we, look, we haven't got a sense of community. We did have, but it's been destroyed. Our community, I, I, I watched the estate in Farley Hill, which was a real close-knit community, has just been destroyed. And that's what now I see those same, those same community spirits are, are building, but on, ta- on the outskirts of towns like this. On the outskirts. And, and it's like in America, everyone feels American. Everyone's embraced being American. And I'll say that even for Muslims. And, and over here, it's, they haven't. They haven't. You get a third-generation Pakistan, and you say, uh, heritage Pakistani and it was still say Pakistani. Tommy, I'm reading a book at the moment uh, by uh, a guy called Douglas Murray, who, by the way, had to have an apology from the BBC because um, an Islamic human rights organisation called him a hate preacher, which is a terrible, terrible slur. The BBC acknowledged that and they uh, apologised in a news bulletin at the same time as the broadcast uh, the following week. Douglas Murray's book is called The Strange Death of Europe. And if I can quote from this, I just want your comment on this. Um, lost in the cosy, consensual, newsnight style of discussion is any reference to what we called our culture, what we used to call our culture. As ever, amid the endless celebrations of diversity, the greatest irony of all remains that the one thing people cannot bring themselves to celebrate is the culture that encouraged such diversity in the first place. In the whole political and press reaction to the last consensus being sorry, the last census, 2011, one saw once again the various staging posts of a direction of travel that is profoundly self-annihilating. Douglas Murray's contention in his first sentence in his book is that Europe is committing suicide, or at least its leaders have decided to commit suicide. Whether the European people choose to go along with this is naturally another matter. I'd agree with every, all, all of it across Europe. We are. When you look at the demographic push for change and you look at what's happening in every country, I said before, when I, when I was growing up, I thought it was a living problem. When we formed the English Defence League, I then realised that all the problems I was experiencing were experiencing in every town and city. And then when we started looking into Europe, when, through the European Defence League, when we set that up, I realised that it's happening everywhere. And then the problem's so bad that if you look at Germany, you look across Europe. And um, it is. And, and for some reason, the people are supporting it. You look in Sweden, when, they, when I see interviews with Swedish people, and it is, it's like the, the country's committing suicide. Mm. The country's committing suicide and has no pride in its own beliefs. Can, no... I, can, I, can I put, a, can I put a, a, um, a utopian view, not a dystopian view? Because so far we've been pretty miserable here in this interview so far. But perhaps oh, if I can, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I put a utopian view to you, though? Uh, a, a view that perhaps we might reach for. Because, you know, our grandchildren have got to live here. Our great-grandchildren... Um, they may continue to be British. They may not intermarry with other cultures. They may continue to be white British or any other demographic which is not Muslim. So the question I'm going to ask is, the modern Greeks are not the ancient Greeks. The Romans are not the Italians. Do you see what I mean? The whole point is, you know, the countries continue and succeed in their various different ways for richer or for poorer, but in peace and relative tranquility, despite the problems that there have been before, despite all the marauding nations that have come in, despite all the regional wars and world wars, Tommy, they have prevailed. And even though Greece is a very different concept to the ancient Greeks, and even though the Italians speak a different language from the Romans grammatically in every way, they're not even the same genetically. Actually, there will be a Britain, but it will be a different one. And that is the way that life is. It'll be a worse one. How will, will it be worse? Freedom. We'll have less freedom. Because the more dominant Islam comes, the more dominant it becomes in our country, the, the, the less freedom. The more Islam, the less freedom. And the more problems. And if you look at that, that's just statistics. You just look at all the problems. And, the, and if you look at the problems we face now. 5% of our country is Islamic. 5%. 
what do we think it's going to be like when it's 20%? That's what I just say to people. What do you think it's going to be like? Like, just look around. If, if we look at France, France is like 7 or 8%. That's why they have so, so many more problems. It's just a numbers game. So I think we should be doing everything we can to limit that and, li- and limit, the, limit the growth of Islam and limit the growth of Sharia in, in Europe and in our country for the sake of our children. For the sake of our children, so I want my children to grow up in a free society, not a society that's ruled or where people are enslaved by Islam. Shall I tell you what scares me? I'll tell you what scares me. The ease by which a terror attack can be committed. All you need is to hire a car or a van, have one or two or three evil people with knives, get out the van and run amok, and you can choose your enemy and the media then does the rest so it can be a group of drinkers in london bridge it can be you know our mps and our house of lords at westminster or indeed it can be children going to a concert in manchester when it attacks certain other groups of people that is when i get very scared indeed tommy it it seems unstoppable it really seems unstoppable well, it is unstoppable. When you look that if we've got 20,000 people on a terror on the terror list, what terrifies me is that in 10 or 15 years' time, that would be 100,000. And then how can we cope? And how, how do you stop that? We... What's the solution, Tommy? What is? How do we stop this? Well, we should be deporting how 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 that 20,000 of them. We should be deporting any of them that are not born here. But, 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 but what about the guys who are British? What about those guys who are born here who are the children of, of British people? If they've been if they've been fighting for ISIS, if they're on the terror watch list because they've been facilitated um, ISIS, then I'd say intern them, intern all of them, intern them because we are at war and we need to accept we're at war, and not wait for them to attack. We're seeing the last the last five of them have all been on watch lists. We've known who they all are. In fact, it's the same in every country in Europe. Every single time a terrorist does something, we know who they are. We they've come, but the, the security services knew exactly who they were, but they just can't simply monitor them all. So that problem, I think, I think in Belgium, is sixty thousand. In Belgium, there's 60,000. And what terrifies me when I'm, the more I look in and the more I learn is the link between our political our politicians, our, even our police forces, and Islamist organisations. In Manchester, Andy Burnham shares a platform with MEND. MEND are extremist, radical Islamic organisation. And then, and then when, the more you look into why this is happening, why they're sharing platforms, the leader of MEND stood in a mosque and he said that we can now sway 30 seats at an election. We can now sway 30 seats. And he actually said one Muslim vote is the equivalent of 10, 10 non-Muslims because we're congregating in small areas. Now, we just had an election and Labour won 32 seats. Now, Andy Burnham, his next policy is to get rid of the prevent scheme, I believe, which, guess what? Men are against prevent, completely speaking out against prevent. So it's like, who's pulling the strings? Well, the more, the more I look into it, when I, when I look at Finsbury Park Mosque most recently, and I started looking into seeing who's behind Finsbury Park Mosque, They've just had a great Muslim Brotherhood PR campaign. They say, they say there's no award-winning mosque. There's no award-winning mosque. It took me 10 minutes to find hate preacher after hate preacher. They're still talking there. To see the extremist organisations. To know that, to know that the local council gives them £100,000. Gives them £100,000. Tommy, they we've are... uh, run out of time for now. Um, you've made your points very clearly. Powerful stuff. Thank you very much. Not to mention the Hezbollah march, the Al-Quds march. You didn't frankly have the balls to put country before party.